morning, everyone. Happy New Year. I think we can say it. Uh, I think this is the last day we can say it. Uh, from here on out, there will always be Sundays in 2024 till the end of the year. Uh, but last week, last Sunday was the 31st. So I think this is the last day I can say Happy New Year to you. I don't know about you, uh, but sickness has been going around. Uh, if it's been going around your ho- in your home, I hope you're not here today. I uh, hope you're watching online with my wife, uh, who is homesick. We've quarantined her to the back of the house in the guest room because I don't want what she's got. Uh, she got uh, she got diagnosed with flu B. I didn't know there was a flu B. Um, there's flu A, flu B. Is there a flu C? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, if there was, that's what I'd get. Uh, I always thought she was an A student. She got B, but whatever. Um, it's highly contagious. Yes. Uh, did you just Google it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. You were with her. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, she she was pretty sick uh, starting Wednesday, and uh, I think she's on the tail end and, and getting better, so hopefully. Well, we're kicking off 21 days of prayer and fasting tomorrow. Uh, if you've been around LifeHouse very long, you know that uh, we uh, kick off the year uh, with a time set aside for prayer and fasting. Um Really, we would love for you to to be a part of this, to engage into it. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about fasting uh, in my message, a little bit more about spending some time in prayer. But we also have prayer on Thursdays at seven o'clock. We'd love for you to come and be a part of that, especially during the 21 days of prayer and fasting. We'd love for you to come and pray with us for an hour. We pray for our Sunday services. We pray for the prayer requests that we get each and every week. And then uh, we just take a time of corporate prayer, praying, lifting up our country, lifting up our world. And God knows that we need prayer uh, in this world if you watch the news. And if you do, shame on you. Uh, you should not. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my journey of, uh, of coming to this place where every year we're, we're doing 21, years, uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting, it feels like we've been doing it for 21 years. Uh, about nine years ago, actually, um, I was at a conference, and uh, I sat there with my wife, and we were listening to a pastor challenge all of us other pastors about our prayer life. And he began to kind of go into something that, a lesson that he had learned uh, years and years ago prior to that, and, uh, and how it had changed and transformed his church, how it changed his life. And I was really convicted by it, because up until that point, it wasn't that I wasn't praying, uh, and it wasn't that I wasn't praying for our church, but uh, up until that time, I, wasn't, I didn't have the same intentionality uh, as to what he was talking about. And so Kelly and I came back from that conference really challenged, really convicted, and began to lead our church, not just in 21 days of prayer and fasting at the beginning of the year, but uh, but to also have a weekly prayer time that has honestly has transformed our church. It's changed us personally, uh, both my wife and I, but it's also changed our church. And I've just seen God's hand of provision over this church uh, over these past uh, nine years that we began doing this. And, and so I want to challenge you in it this morning. And, and my challenge today is a little bit stronger than, uh, than most Sundays, but I thought we'd kick off the year with a bang and, uh, and just you know, really dive into the things that uh, I think will absolutely make a difference in our 2024 Most people, if we're being honest, find ourselves in a place of prayer when we need God to do something in our life. You've maybe heard the phrase, uh, make prayer your first priority and not your last resort. I would uh, echo that statement. 
that oftentimes what happens is we find ourselves going along in our everyday life and we find ourselves just going about life and it's not until something hits us that now all of a sudden we're in a place to where we're on our knees and praying. And it's in those moments where we're faced with something of a challenge or something that it's like in those moments that's when we put in a prayer request or we come to prayer or we come to church and and it's in those moments kind of almost as if it's our last resort where we've done everything that we know how to do and we still haven't seen any sort of breakthrough in it. And so now it's like, okay, God, I'll, I'll give you a chance to fix this. And I just want to challenge that thinking this morning. And I, I really hope that uh, as we are challenged to go into 21 days of prayer, uh, that it sets forth in us a desire to to have prayer be a priority, not just in these 21 days, but all the way through the rest of our life. I want to kick off uh, this season uh, with a message today called, uh, I first heard this by a pastor named Robert Morris. Uh, He refers to it as the principle of the first. And this is a principle that runs all throughout scripture. It's It always works, and the premise of it is that if God is first in your life, then everything else can come into order. And if God is not first in your life, then nothing can come into order. And when I say everything comes into order, what I'm what I'm not saying is that you're not going to have trials or, or troubles or tribulation, right? Jesus said that we will have tribulations, but be of good cheer because I have come to overcome the world. I don't mean we don't have problems. We will still have problems. I don't mean that we won't have those moments of tribulation in our life. Of course we will. But when we make God a priority, and he is first in every aspect of our life, when those trials and those tribulations come, (laughs) we can get through them. We can navigate those, those waters, and it's because we have made him first, and he has control of our life already. Now, I want to kind of theme the message around the first words that we see in all of Scripture in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God. So, in the beginning, of everything that you do, God. In the beginning of your marriage, God. In the beginning of your work, God. In the beginning of school, God. In the beginning of your home, God. In the beginning of your day, God. That every aspect of your life in the beginning is God. Culturally, what we find is that God is a part of our life, but not in all aspects of our life. That that we find ourselves, and I would say, I would make an argument that probably, um, well, when we first moved here 16 years ago from the Northwest, one of the interesting dynamics that we encountered was this idea that, that people go to church socially, but they just kind of live their life however they want to live it. And this was an, an anomaly to me because where we came from, there was no real social reason to go to church. If you went to church, you were pretty committed to church and, and committed to your relationship with God. And here it was like, okay, well, I, we, we go to church because that's what we do, that, that God is a part of that portion of our life. And I find that very dangerous, that God doesn't want to just be a part of, he doesn't want to just be your Sunday God. He doesn't want to just be a part of your life. He wants to be a part of every aspect of your life. The next place where the word first is mentioned in Scripture is two pages later in Genesis chapter 4, verse verse 2 through 5. And In this chapter, this is uh, Adam and Eve's kids, Cain and Abel, right? And you've got Abel, who's a shepherd, and you've got Cain, who's a farmer. And the description that we see is that in the course of time, and that's really important, in the course of time, Cain 
brought some of the fruits of the soil, some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. I just find that interesting. Why is that? Is it because Abel brought the firstborn, the first of his flock, and Cain just brought some of his crops? Now, what I'm about to share with you, it's really important that you hear me say this this morning, is you cannot believe what I'm about to tell you and still go to heaven. That's good news this morning, right? Because you're like, I don't know if I believe that. You can still go to heaven. You can still be a Christian. You can still be a Christ follower and not believe what I'm about to tell you. And you say, well, then why are you going to tell us this if, if it's not necessary to make it to heaven? I'm telling you this because one of the greatest challenges that I have being a pastor is encountering people and talking with people about what God has for them, and people actually settling for less. And, and I believe, and what I'm about to share with you, is that this is one of the greatest ways that you can start out your year in, in, in this 2024 year is making a commitment to begin living this out in your life, and that is that God must be first. That God must be first in every area of your life. There, a few years ago on Christmas Eve, I did a, uh, I had an illustration, and I had my mom's nativity scene out here, and uh, it was this big, it's huge. She got it in Israel. It's made out of olive wood, right? I, that, okay, yeah. Uh, and and so it's 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 all the pieces and this beautiful set. And what I did in my illustration is I took the uh, I took the manger and I set it over to the side. And then throughout my, my sharing, my teaching, I, I'd bring like the shepherds and I'd put them in the center as kind of this representation of our work that oftentimes we live our life with our work as the center of everything that we do. And, and then I would move them out and I'd put the wise men in there and I'd be like, our money is often the center of everything that we do. And then just kind of being funny, I put the animals in the center, and you're like, well, well, why are they in the center? It's because I've seen some of your social media posts uh, with your animals. <laughs> For some of you, your animals are the center of everything that you do. And obviously, it's kind of a joke, but it was really a representation of our hobbies, those things that we like, and oftentimes we make those the center of everything that we do. The manger was still in the scene. Jesus was still there in the scene. It just wasn't in the, in the center. And that's really what we're talking about today is where is Jesus in our life? Is he in the center or have we set him over to the side and brought other things into the middle of the scene, into the middle of our life? And we find ourselves wanting recognizing that there's got to be more, but not recognizing where the rightful place is of God in our life. In the first of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 3, it says, and God spoke all of these words. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And by the way, uh, God gave his first and his best, and his name is Jesus. This morning, we're going to receive communion as a reminder of that sacrifice that was made. I didn't share this in, in, uh, in first service, but we got all the time in the world in second service. So I just thought I would share this with you. I found this very interesting. I, I've been researching a little bit more on fasting and praying uh, for this season. And I heard a, a pastor share uh, an understanding of a scripture that I never that I'd never really seen before. And it was in Exodus chapter 13, verses 12 or 11 through 13. They don't have it up on the screen because I, I wasn't sure if I was going to share it, but 
It says, after the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised an oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. Anybody ever read that scripture and just wonder, what's that about? Like, that's like Old Testament stuff. And, and you know what? It's like, uh, it's, it's messy and it's weird. And I don't, we don't need to worry about that. Listen, it, this is a principle that we see in here. And I want to show something to you that I'd never seen before. And I did graduate from Bible college, but... I'd never seen this. Now, look at what it says. It says, all the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. So there were clean animals, unclean animals, right? Sheep were what? Clean. Donkeys, not clean. And, and so, interestingly, if you had a firstborn donkey, you had to kill it was unclean, you had to kill a clean animal to redeem the firstborn donkey. It's interesting, right? And then you think about us, just as an example. When we were born into this world, were we born clean or unclean? Unclean. We have a sin nature. I don't know, all I have to do is ask the parents in this room, hey, do you have to teach your kids how to be bad? No, you don't have to teach your kids how to be bad. You've got to teach them how to be good. They're born with a sin nature. When Jesus was born into this world, was he born clean or unclean? Clean. You see where the story's going. There had to be a sacrifice of the clean in order to redeem the unclean. It's an interesting, all out of a donkey, not getting his neck broken. It's pretty amazing. It's a beautiful picture of this principle of the first, of the firstborn, of the first of every aspect of our life. And God gave his first and his best so that we could be redeemed. So we put God first by giving him the first of everything. God doesn't want to be just our Sunday God. He wants to be part of it all. He wants to be at the center of everything that we do. Leviticus 27:30, a tithe of everything from the land. And I know you're probably thinking, "Oh, this is a money sermon. This isn't just about money." So, a tithe of everything the first of your year, the first of your week, the first of your day, the first of your thoughts, the first words that come out of your mouth, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Proverbs 3, 9, honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. So God must be first, and we put God first by giving him not just a few parts of our life, but we give him everything, and the first has the power to bless the rest. Now, there's a ton of different words uh, for the word prosper in Scripture, in, in the Hebrew language. Now, most of us, and, and this may not be you, but many of us, and I would be one that's included in that, when we hear the word prosper from a pastor on a platform, it makes us a little hesitant. Right? Oh, are you one of those prosperity churches? Well, probably not in the context that you're thinking of. Right? We're, we're not. We're not a name and acclaim it church. We're not this prosperity money driven church. But if you look at the definition of, pros, of prosper, if you look at the other definitions, it's prosper, it's favor, it's. it's uh, 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 provision, it's all of these things that we are, that we see, that we appreciate about who God is in this church. So, so if you say, well, are you a, pro a prosperity church? No, not in that context. But to be honest with you, if you're talking about 
a church that puts God in its rightful place, in his rightful place, and ordering everything that we do around who he is and making him first, then yes, we are about God's grace and God's favor over this church. The first has the power to bless the rest. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So this is what I want for us so badly. And I decided to go a little bit stronger today and ask a lot of you. This is a conversation that typically I would have with maybe another pastor who's, uh, who I'm coaching or uh, maybe uh, my family in, in the beginning of the year, having that conversation with them. Uh, but this is, I just felt like, you know what, if, if we're going to, we're going to really see change in 2024. Uh, I think this is a conversation worth having. And by conversation, I don't mean you get to talk back, but I just mean <laughs> that something I could share with you. Here it is. This is the first challenge. Give God the first of my year with prayer and fasting. I say, well, of course, Pastor Ryan, that's what we're doing. Like you just said, we're going into a time of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Yeah, I know that's what I said, but what I really mean by that is that you and me and you and you would set aside the first of your year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. That this wouldn't just be a program that our church does or that our denomination does, but this would be something internal that we're saying, I'm committed to being about this at the beginning of my year. And I, I don't want to, I, I'm, I'm, I definitely don't want to cast judgment, and I'm, and I'm sure this is not any of you, but every year that we've done this, every year that we've gone through 21 days of prayer and fasting, any time that we've ever provided a resource, and this is one of the resources that we have, our denominations going through it, there's churches all across the country and the world starting tomorrow with 21 days of prayer and fasting. But any time we've offered any sort of resource uh, for y'all, we have tons of them left over, a lot. Which, I'm not, I'm not trying to correlate the two, but, but it feels like at times there's me and, and 12 other people praying and fasting through the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Now, that sounded a little arrogant. I, it just, it, I don't mean to imply like, oh, I'm doing it, but you're not doing it. That, that's what it sounded like, but I don't mean to be that harsh about it. I'm just saying... It's interesting to me that every year we do this and we go through it, it's almost as if that's something that our church is doing, but it's not necessarily something I'm doing. And what I'm challenging us in this year is to say, okay, I'm going to set aside some time, 21 days, to pray and fast in some sort of capacity. Now, Jesus is and was God. Jesus is also ma was man on this earth, and while he was on this earth, he set an example for us. He started with baptism. The first thing that we, uh, story that we see is Jesus being baptized, and it's the kickoff of his ministry. And as soon as he's done being baptized, what happens? He goes off into the wilderness, and he prays, and he fasts. He spends time with the Father. And it's in that moment that there's this anointing that takes place. And you say, well, he's God. Isn't he already anointed? And yes, but he knew that the ministry he was about to do could not be done without the connection with the Father and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in his life. There were people that needed to be healed before he went out into the wilderness. There were messages that needed to be preached. But he prioritized this time to pray and fast. And Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And 
how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And that's what I want for us as a church, is to be able to go into 2024 seeing people healed and ministry take place and people grow in their relationship with him. And what I'm asking is, and what I'm contending for, is that this starts, that starts with this, with setting aside a time to be focused on him in prayer and in fasting. I don't think I uh, fully understood the the power and the um, yeah the power of fasting. I, I I've always known that that's something that's good. It's something that we it's a time we set aside. It's getting rid of something that has been maybe a priority in our life, and in place of that, putting a time of prayer. I, I understood all that. But there's something powerful that takes place when we make the decision to step into that. I was, as as I said, I've been kind of listening to different teachings and reading books on prayer and fasting. And I heard a, a story, an illustration that I had not ever heard before. And it had to do with our country. And I was surprised by this. So I had to look it up to make sure it was actually true before I shared it with you. Did you know that Abraham Lincoln, in the middle of the Civil War, in 1863, he called for the fourth of the nation to fast and pray? I did not know this. And those people prayed and fasted. And you know what happened? Not only did the the war come to an end, almost immediately after that, Alaska was sold to the United States by Russia. For 7.2, I think, million dollars? Yeah, two pennies per acre. I don't care how long ago that was, that's a good deal. To, to, it's a real good deal. The like, acre now is like, what, $150,000? Two pennies per acre. And then, listen to this, this is crazy. For the next 28 years after that, America operated their federal budget with a surplus we don't even know what that word means anymore. It's like surplus. We don't have a definition for that. It's like we, we know debt. We know trillions. We, we don't know surplus. I mean, could you imagine Congress just sitting around at the Capitol saying, we got so much money, we don't even know what to do with it all. I mean, they kind of do that anyways, but it's, the problem is, is we don't have the money. <laughs> They're saying, you know what? We don't have any money, but we don't know what to do with it all. I'm just begging you, begging you to put God first and see what happens. Listen, if you don't, if you don't believe any of what I'm telling you this morning, you're still going to go to heaven. You're still a Christian. I'm just saying I know that this will make a difference. So how, how do you fast? Well, there's lots of different fasts. There's a lot of different resources. We have resources on our website. If you go to 21 Days of Prayer at the top banner of our website, we've put resources in there on prayer, on fasting, different ways to fast. But just as a, an overview, overview, you could do a complete fast, just liquids only, right? Which you should talk to your doctor before you do that. Make sure that you're good to go. I definitely could probably handle a liquids only diet. Uh, I mean, fast. It was a joke. I was waiting for you to say, no, Pastor Ryan, you look so fit and healthy and everything looks good. You can do a selective fast where you select different types of foods that you're going to eat or you're not going to eat. A very common, popular one is the Daniel fast. I talked to somebody this week who uh, has already started their fast and they're fasting caffeine, which is terrible to be around right now. And then, uh, and then I talked to somebody else who's only eating protein and vegetables, and, uh, and they're more pleasant to be around, uh, but a little bit harder to cook for. And so it's, it's selective fasting. It's finding something that you're going to cut out. Maybe that's breads. Maybe that's sugars, whatever. A partial fast. This is where you're eating kind of wherever, whatever you want, uh, but you're eliminating a meal out of your day, out of your week, 
Uh, it might be breakfast, it might be dinner, it might be lunch, whatever, whatever is a priority to you. If you don't already have breakfast, like you can't say, well, I'm fasting breakfast. Like that's not, that's not how this works. Like it's, it's, I, I don't ever eat breakfast. I know I probably should, which is probably why I'm not healthy, but, uh, but I don't ever eat breakfast. I can't say I'm not going to. I'm going to fast breakfast. It's just not how this works. Okay, I think you know that. And then the, there's the fourth one, a soul fast. A soul fast is eliminating like media and specifically social media. I did this one uh, a few years ago or a couple years ago, and it was uh, I, I eliminated Facebook from, from, that was my fast, was to just not get on Facebook for 21 days. And I'm not on Facebook anymore. It's awesome. Like, I don't, I, I don't, it's, if you comment on my Facebook page, you're probably never going to get a response from me. I'll check it once a year to make sure that n- no one's dying or something along those lines, but, but I just don't, I'm not on it. And, and I'm not saying that as any pat on my back. I'm just saying, what is it for you? What is something that's damaging to your soul? I'm on other social medias, by the way. I don't post on them very often. I'm like the one pastor in the world that doesn't post to you what I'm eating for breakfast or anything else. But, um, but what is it that needs to be eliminated? Maybe that's the news, as I said earlier. Maybe that's other things. Like, There's just things that we set aside and say I'm not going to be a part of. And here's the thing is this isn't just for adults. It's for the entire family. Because it's never too early to start introducing spiritual disciplines into our children. And you're like, there ain't no way my kid's fasting. It may, maybe not. But could you let them understand and know why it is that you're fasting? And model for them what that looks like. And what you'll find is your kids are actually getting a copy of what's called, uh, I believe it's called Family Moments. And we've already printed all of those out. We're giving those to your kids. These are things that they're taking home. So Family Moments is mentioned in this book. And by the way, this is free, which is even more weird why people don't take it. But it's free. Uh, You can grab it on your way out. Uh, But then you can also just spend some time with your kids and have this moment where you're coming together. And it can be an opportunity for you to model for them some of the principles and disciplines of our faith. Uh, We also, if you go down our kids' hall, on the wall, there's resources for every stage of your kid's life. And uh, and there's books that we've vetted. There's things that are up there that you can get that are resources that help you teach your kids about prayer, teach them about fasting. Uh, The only thing we ask is, listen, we can't buy all of those books for everybody or for every family. And so uh, they're just there for display. Just take a picture of the QR code, and it'll take you right to the book, and you can get it there as well. So number two, give God the first of my month. So give him the first of our year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. Give God the first of my month with tithes and offerings. Oh, here we go. Just another pastor talking about money. Honestly, I don't teach on this a lot. I I talk much more about this in our membership class. I go into more detail of what it means to be a part of a faith community and all of that. And, and here's what you need to hear me say, and this may be a little controversial to some of you and may be freeing to others. Tithing isn't a New Testament law. Tithing isn't about salvation. You can actually be a Christian and go to heaven and not have tithed. I'm just telling you that when you set aside the first And it's not even about money, but when you set aside the first and you put God first in your life, it makes a huge difference in your life. Deuteronomy 14.23 says, The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God in first place in your life. It absolutely works. And you say, well, is this a, a prosperity name it and claim it? point? No, it's not. I'm just telling you that as a pastor, it's, it's radically changed my life. And, and your pastor tithes. It would be crazy if I stood up here and said, hey, you need to set aside a tithe to the Lord and then me not do that. 
And you'd be shocked as to how many pastors actually don't tithe. They stand before their congregations and they say, we believe in the tithe. Their, their livelihood is dependent upon that principle, and yet they don't then do that. That's, if that's not the definition of hypocrisy, I don't know what it is. Will they go to heaven? Yeah, they will. Will they have all that God has for them? Absolutely not. I, I just said that out loud. I, I was thinking it in my head, but I said it out loud. But I, but I believe it. I, I feel very, very strongly about this principle when it comes to our money. And, and, it's, and listen, I, this is a principle that my dad, or a, a lesson my dad taught me early, early on in ministry. He said, never talk about money when you need it. We had a great fiscal year for 2023. We, we I don't I always get them confused. We were under budget. Well, we hit our budget, but, but our tithable uh, income was over that. So th- this isn't me coming to you saying, oh, we're hurting. We need your money. This is not what this is about. This is about a principle that teaches you to always put God in first place of your life. Just tell on myself a little bit, there's going to be a little confession this morning, quite a few years ago. Well, 16 years ago when we first got here, uh, the church was struggling financially. We had a $13,000 building payment for a church of about 123 people, 125 people, not anybody's counting, but I was. And we couldn't, make our, we couldn't make our payment. We couldn't make our mortgage payment. And, and so there was, uh, I had to take a pay deduction. My, my first council meeting with our church council was like, sorry, I know we told you we could pay your family this, but we can't. And so you're going to have to take a deduction. We're going to have to fire those people that you brought with you. And we're going to have to refinance our, our mortgage at the time to an interest-only loan and all of these things. And it was just, it was a hard time. We, we obviously made it through all of that, but a few years later, at the end of the year, we had uh, one of the largest giving months that we had ever had prior to that. It was a huge month. And even during those lean times of the church where the church was struggling, we still tithed. We still gave for church planning. We gave to our organization. We gave to missions, all of those things. And we still did all of that, even though we were struggling. And then a few years later, we had one of the greatest Decembers that we'd ever had financially. And, and so this is, was my thought, was I went to the church council in January. And I said, I got this idea. I said, the, the tithe this month is going to be significantly larger than anything we had ever done in the past. And so I'm just wondering, you know, Rather than tithe all of it to where we normally tithe to our denomination uh, for church planning and stuff, do, what if we were to hold some of that back and, and then give that away to some of these other ministries that we're, we're wanting to fund? And almost as soon as I could get the words out of my mouth, the church council I, is like, I'm figuratively using pitchforks and torches, but... But they were like, wait a minute, we haven't sent the tithe check yet? You're telling me that that money's still in our account? And I'm like, uh, I just, I kind of wanted to wait and talk to you about this and see what your thoughts were. I mean, I, my motivation was good, but they're like, absolutely not. We give all of that away. And then if there's extra, if there's more, we'll do this. Is the last time I've ever asked the council to do anything other than just tithe it directly. It was a principle that I knew, but came to and, and was really kind of challenged by, and I share that with you because I'm sure there's many of us in this room who have had those same thoughts. I'm like, well, what if, I, what if I just, you know, don't give all of my tithe to the church, but I hold some out for this or that or whatever. And I just want to challenge that thinking. And by the way, that just goes to show you how good the stewardship of our councils in past and in present are. They believe in this principle. You can't be on our church council 
unless you are a tithing member of our church. And we're going to actually vote uh, to, to put two more council members at the end of this month on our church council, but I'll get into that at the end of the month. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. I know this is such a common passage of scripture when people, when pastors are talking about money, but it's just, the point of this is that the storehouse is where you worship, right? That there may be food in my house and it says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you, yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord. It would be nice to be called the delightful land. <laughs> And wouldn't it be nice just to, as you're going through life and people are like, man, it just seems like there, everything is, is in order of your life. And for you to be able to say, yeah, it has to do with putting God first in my life. In every aspect. And again, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about every aspect of our life that we put God first. Number three, this is going to be challenging Give God the first of my week with consistent church attendance and true Sabbath. Most Christians, their Sabbath is that day that they worship. It's a challenge to really set the day aside, to come, to worship, to engage with other believers, and then to rest as I said, this is a little bit of confession time. For me, Sabbathing is really, really hard. My Sabbath is not on Sundays. This is a work day. You guys aren't a lot of work, but it is a work day. Uh, prepare a message, preach a message. We have our youth tonight. We got our invite night, so we'll be here again tonight. Fridays are my Sabbath, or at least they're supposed to be my Sabbath. And I struggle with that at times. I struggle with setting aside a full day where I'm engaged in the word, when I'm worshiping him, or I'm not working. I'm, I'm setting all of the distractions aside. It's hard. But I'm challenging you to do this with me. And I, I'll do my best to, with God's strength to continue to do this and to do this really, really well. But whatever day that is for you, it may not be Sundays, it may be Saturdays, maybe a different day in the week based upon your work schedule or whatever, but whatever that is, I pray that you would consider joining me in a consistent church attendance and true Sabbath. Luke 4, 16, Jesus again models this where he had been brought up, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went in to the place of worship, to the synagogue, as was his custom. I read that Harvard came out with a study um, to try and figure out how to reduce the divorce rate in America. Uh, that the divorce rate was uh, one out of every two, so 50%. And they were trying to figure out, is there any uh, recipe or methods that might lower that percentage? And they actually discovered, and again, this is Harvard University. I know it may have been founded as a Christian university. Uh, I think we can say it's not. And this goes all the way back to the principle of the first that I was talking about in the beginning. Here's the evidence. Hard data evidence that if you attend church, if you discuss the Bible and pray, it will lower the percentage from one out of two to one out of 1,246. Of course it will. Like, of course, if you're attending church regularly, you're discussing the Bible with your spouse and your family, and you're praying together, of course that's going to lower the divorce rate. It's not a surprise, but there's the facts for you. There's the hard data if you need it. And number four, give God the first of my day with the word, with worship, and in prayer. Again, this is a challenge for me. It's not a challenge to give God 
time in worship, time in the word, and time in prayer, it's hard for me to give him the first. I'm a night owl. I like to stay up late, get up late, head to work, get on about my day. And the first thing that, that is put off to the side is this. It's, e- it's easy for me to set that aside. I know you guys are surprised by that. You probably think all I do every day is to read the word and worship and pray. It's all I'm doing in my office. But there's more to it than that, a little bit. I'm just challenging you, at least for these next 21 days, would you consider doing this with me to to set aside the first of our day? And I'm supposed to be on a flight at 7 a.m. on Tuesday. So while I'm sitting in the airport, I'm going to be giving him the first of my day. And, And you can text me, send a social media post and say, did you do it? Now I'm forced to do it. I will do it. Mark 135 says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Psalm 5.3 says, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait, patient, uh, wait expectantly. It doesn't mean that God only hears you in the morning. Of course, God doesn't mind hearing from you all day long. But the challenge is is to set aside the first of your day. And so the challenge is this. This is what I'm committing to. Five minutes in the word, five minutes in worship, five minutes in prayer. It's not a huge commitment. Fifteen minutes. You say, well, how am I going to worship? Put some earbuds in. Put on some worship music. Raise your hands. Look like a fool. Right? What would that look like? You just began to worship the Lord wherever you are the first of your day. The reason why the challenge is so strong today is because I know what God has for you. I know what's available to you. And I've experienced this in my own life. Not just in tithing. There's parts of my life where this is easier than others, as I said, The tithing principle is not a problem for me. It's an easy thing for me to do. That may not be an easy thing for you. But the 15 minutes in the morning, it's going to be a challenge. So whatever it is that's a challenge for you, I'm asking, would you be willing to just take another step? Would you just be willing to see what would happen? If you're happy with where you're at, don't change anything. But if you're not happy with where you're at spiritually, what do we have to lose? I mean, like, what, what is there to lose, really, if we're not happy with how things are going spiritually in our life and in every aspect of our life? Then what if we were to place God first and foremost in every aspect of our life and just see how things go? There's a, a story, an old fable has five chapters to it. I think it probably adequately describes all of us at some stage in our spiritual journey, but the titles of the chapter are this. I went out for a walk, and I fell into a deep, dark hole, and it took me a long time to get out. It's a long chapter title. Chapter number two is, I went out for a walk, and I fell into the same deep, dark hole, and it took me a long time to get out. Chapter three is, I went out for a walk and I got too close to the deep dark hole and I fell in and it took me a long time to get out. Chapter four is, I went out for a walk and I saw the deep dark hole and I walked around it. And chapter five is, I went for a walk and I went down a different street. (laughs) Makes sense, right? Like if we've been trying the same things year after year after year after year and still getting the same results, maybe it's time to walk down a different street. Listen, this isn't about money. We don't need it. It's it's not that if everybody's like, oh, you don't need it, let's just stop tithing. I mean, obviously things function around here because of it. But it's not because we're in need. 
But this is a principle that says, God, you are first in every area of my life. When I go to work tomorrow, you're first. When I go to school tomorrow, you're first. When I go into my home tonight and I'm with my kids, you are first. I'm just asking you to go down a different street with me. Let's pray.